We're sponsored today by Provider Solutions and Development, expert recruitment advisors with exclusive access to hundreds of positions nationwide for physicians and advanced practice clinicians. Start the conversation or reach out to one of their career navigators today at info.psdconnect.org forward slash curbsiders. That's info.psdconnect.org forward slash curbsiders. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Paul, this was a packed episode, and I was above average excited for this one, as you could tell. <laughs> yeah, slightly manic even, but that's okay. So this is The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto, here with my good friend, Dr. Paul Williams. And tonight's on tonight's show, we talked about, we're calling this one hypertension uh, FAQ. There are a lot of frequently asked questions, things that uh, we come across pretty commonly in clinic. Our guest is Dr. Jordy Cohen. Paul, before I tell them more about our guest and the topic, can you tell them what is it that we do on the curbsiders? (laughs) We'll start working out these beginnings. It'll be okay. Yeah, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And as you mentioned, we talked to to Dr. Cohen tonight, who has changed, I think, the way I'm going to manage all my blood pressure patients from now on. So apparently just diuretics for everyone, plus or minus a milleride. I think (laughs) you'll tell us more about what we learned about. Yeah. So there. Yeah. On the show, we do talk about we talk about the the new start on blood pressure. You know, making the initial diagnosis. That's the first case. There's a case we talk about how to manage blood pressure in CKD four, like advanced CKD. And then the the last case is a case of resistant hypertension, refractory hypertension. There's just like too many pearls to talk about. Our guest is Dr. Jordana Jordy Cohen, MD, MSCE. She's a nephrologist, hypertension specialist, and epidemiologist at the University of Pennsylvania, where she spends most of her time geeking out about blood pressure. She is a member of the Freely Filtered podcast team. She is the principal investigator of several NIH studies investigating the treatment and measurement of hypertension in high-risk patients and has leadership roles related to this within the American Heart Association and the American Medical Association. A reminder that this and most episodes will be available for free CME credit for all health professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.org. And with all that, let's get to the show. So Jordy, it's so great having you on the show. I'm really excited to talk hypertension, but first give the audience a one-liner about yourself and give them a hobby or interest outside of medicine. Uh, yeah, so I am a 37-year-old nephrologist at uh, University of Pennsylvania. I am a hypertension specialist and an epidemiology methods nerd that uh, all I do all day is think about hypertension and how to better study it and how to better use the, what I learn to treat my patients. Uh, my main hobby outside of medicine is rock climbing and mountaineering. I do a lot of winter uh, backpacking trips too. What exactly is mountaineering? I'm somebody that probably isn't outside as much as I should be, certainly not in the woods or the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> uh, usually I think of it as situations where you probably need some sort of ice axe and rope to get up the side of a mountain, uh, a little tougher than the usual hike, but still it's 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 a fun version of hiking. Ice axe sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. That, that sounds like a lot of fun. It's also a great subway defense mechanism in Philly. I sometimes will strap it to my backpack. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No, once again, our, our guests making me feel like I don't have very good hobbies. Um, but along those lines, the hobbies that I do have are the same boring ones that everyone has, but I, I am, I'm looking for distraction always. And usually we do book recommendations. I've been recently broadening it to kind of any, any piece of culture that you found, um, useful or compelling. So anything at all that you want to share with us that you've enjoyed recently that will serve as a distraction for my brain, book, movie, TV show, whatever album that you'd liked. I read uh, 1591 recently, which is this great book about uh, what actually happened in the Americas uh, before uh, we actually, like before it was truly um, taken over by white colonists um, and how quickly uh, different um, native groups were wiped out by disease. Uh, a lot of, it goes into the, some of the immunogenicity of uh, of how 
different groups were wiped out so quickly and some of the genetics of it too. It's really fascinating. Well written. That, that sounds interesting and grim, I, <laughs> which means right up my alley, actually. So that, that is a terrific recommendation. Thank you. It's very relevant these days. Um, what about, how about a favorite learning experience you've had? We could call it a favorite failure if that's not too scary of a term, but can you tell us, I mean, you've, you're, you've accomplished quite a bit already and, but we want to know about something. I'm sure everything hasn't come as easy. So tell us about something that wasn't as easy for you. Honestly, it was more for my hobbies than from work. Work stuff is always tough. I feel like we have a million failures at work, but I, I, I prefer to be thinking about what I learned from life experiences outside of it. Uh, so my biggest one was um, actually the only time that I've ever turned back on a trip, uh, one of our winter hiking trips. Um, my husband is a little less intense than me when it goes to winter hiking uh, and any of the crazy things that I do. So he's the person I would always have thought of would be the first one to turn us back. Um, but it was actually me a couple of years ago. We were on a winter hike and it, I'd been in like negative 60 before, like in crazy cold weather. But this particular one, it wasn't quite as cold, but something just felt a little bit not quite right. Uh, and I said, you know what? We have to turn around. I don't know why something is wrong. And I was never one of those people to really believe in like going with your gut on something like that. Um, but I did. I forced us to turn around. Uh, we get back down to the bottom of the mountain probably about it was at, like 12 hours earlier than what we expected to. And I realized I couldn't feel my large toe on my right foot, um, yeah. which I hadn't been able to tell from the hike because it was so cold out. Um, and we got down and I had frostbite on my toe. Um, toe was saved. It did great. No problems with it. Works fun completely normal now. <laughs> um, but I, I consider that one of my best failures because I'm just so glad I didn't finish hiking that peak or I probably would have had much a much worse outcome. Yikes. Paul, you've had such an experience. I no, I have not. That is <laughs> harrowing, um, and why I don't go outside. But I mean, I'm, I'm glad that everything worked out okay. Well, my husband's uh, t his takeaway from it, he said, is that doctors are crazy. We learn to have too high of a pain tolerance, and so <laughs> that sounds really scary. Well, I'm glad that you still have your toe. Um, you. <laughs> before we get on to the topic, I wanted to ask, did you have any favorite advice or feedback that you've had at any point during, and l let's relate this one to your career or to medicine? Yeah. So my main mentor is Ray Townsend. Uh, he's really a character and a half. Um, he's a hypertension specialist who just retired last year at UPenn. Uh, and he loved the, the making the statement that as clinicians, we tend to use statistics like a drunk uses a lamppost more for support than for illumination. And I really love that quote um, in terms of thinking about the fact that if we learn something from stats or from a study that agrees with what we expect, we have no problem swallowing it. But if it somehow challenges our expectations, we challenge it more. We won't let it sort of open our eyes to new possibilities. And so I always have sort of embraced that as a way of checking my biases. Right. It's like uh, your confirmation bias or just like kind of picking and choosing studies based on what supports what you already believe. Exactly. Yes. The, I'm sure that's always a tempting trap for, for everyone to fall into because uh, we all have egos and we all want to be, we just, we just want to be right. We don't want to feel stupid about things. Right, Paul? I mean, I, I'm fine with feeling stupid. <laughs> that's my baseline. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll start us off with a case from Cashlack here. We're going to have like three cases or three, three, yeah, three cases. I guess it's kind of four cases. One of them is, is barely a full case, but three cases here um, for the audience. New diagnosis of high blood pressure. Uh, one of them is going to be a person with CKD with high blood pressure. And then finally, a person with difficult to control high blood pressure and how we handle that. These are all common clinical scenarios. And these are based on things that I've seen recently in clinic that were just really, I'm like, maybe I don't know all this as well as I should. So let's talk to somebody who knows this better. And uh, and hopefully we'll get some answers um, that will be helpful to other people as well. I suspect they will. Our first case here is Tom. And Tom is 35 years old, BMI is 31, smokes a little bit, about a half a pack a day, doesn't really have a strong family history of heart disease or stroke, but he thinks maybe my dad's on medicine for high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And he's here today, doesn't have any specific complaints, just says, I want to be checked for everything. This is like one of these, Paul, have you seen this person? They haven't seen anyone for a while and they're just like, just check me for everything. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like it's it's been part of a pandemic phenomenon too, where people are just sort of hyper aware of their health and just kind of want to make sure everything's okay. So yeah, every so often. So 
let's say six months ago he was here, his blood pressure was 155 over 95. Today, it's 165 over 100. We have no home readings from him. And he's like, you know, maybe two years ago it was high at the dentist. I don't exactly know what the numbers were. He, he's not even sure what is the exact real, um, you know, normal blood pressure. So how would you sort of confirm whether or not this guy has high blood pressure? How would you s- sort of approach this, Jordy? Yeah. So first and foremost is uh, I consider, no offense to any dentist listening, but I consider dental office blood pressures to be works of fiction. Uh, So I I think that's first and foremost, but (laughs) it it can potentially flag some folks that might be at risk of hypertension, but I think more often it's a sense of anxiety and pain. Um, And so I think the first and First thing is repeat the blood pressure. But the key is we really need to be doing it in a more standardized way. And it's hard to do that. To diagnose hypertension, we should be basing it off of at least two office visits, blood pressures. Um, They should be at least a couple of months apart, ideally three months apart. Um, And we should be doing it with really high quality measurements, which we often don't do. Um, We have a habit of going to of checking patients blood pressure in the office over clothing. Wrong size cuff is really common. And everyone's favorite place to check a blood pressure is on the exam table because often that's where the blood pressure cuffs are attached to the wall right next to it. Biggest problem with that is as a five foot four woman, my feet don't touch the floor of an exam table and your back is never supported. Um, So feet not on the floor, back unsupported, arm often dangling by your side. I asked a medical assistant to hold my arm up the other day when she was checking my blood pressure and she looked at me like I was crazy and told me that, no, you can't do that when checking my blood pressure. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Then I introduced myself and then she got a little meaner um, and my blood pressure. I had the best white coat effect that day. Um, and so I, uh, I, it's, we have a real problem with blood pressure checks in our country. And so this is a, why there's a big push for using automated office blood pressure. Um, it's not just an automated or electronic device, but it's a validated device that actually checks the average of three readings, one after the other. Um, you only need about 30 seconds between the readings. The devices have a pre-programmed 30 to 60 second difference between each reading. The problem is it takes space, it takes time uh, to do that perfectly. And so it's hard to do that. But that would be the ideal. But if not, at right. least a really high quality measurement where you follow all those important steps of positioning and using a valid calibrated deb- device, which we often can't do. Yeah. Really, because we can't. Yeah. The best thing to do is off is out of office blood pressure checks to really confirm a diagnosis of hypertension. The USPSDF now actually recommends that for the confirming the diagnosis as level one evidence. And so that we should get a really high quality either home or 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure measurement. Um, and I can talk about home ones for another 20 minutes. <laughs> We're sponsored by Southern California Permanente Medical Group. SCPMG, and let me tell you that they are actively seeking outpatient internal medicine physicians to join their clinics throughout Southern California, and who doesn't want to live in Southern California? We're in the middle of the winter here, people. SCPMG is a physician-led partnership organization that will give you the opportunity to practice high-quality medicine with a fulfilling practice where you're going to benefit from backup support, no overnight call, flexible scheduling, and work-life balance. Join them and enjoy a practice that's free from the hassles of running an office, developing your patient base, prior authorizations, and insurance billing. There's even the potential opportunities for teaching and blended outpatient slash inpatient roles. If you want to make a difference in a community that appreciates your passion and expertise, then join SCPMG as an outpatient internal medicine physician Learn more or apply at scpmgphysiciancareers.com. That's scpmgphysiciancareers.com or call 866-449-1684. This episode is sponsored by Stamps.com. Come on, curbsiders. We all know that time is money and we don't want to waste either one with trips to the post office But fortunately, there is Stamps.com, which lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process so you can spend less time at the post office and more time making your customers happy. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has helped over 1 million businesses, and that's because they have all the post office and UPS shipping services that you need, and you can do it right from your own computer, and you're going to get discounts that you can't find anywhere else, like up to 40% off, USPS rates and 76% off UPS. 
All you need is a computer and a standard printer. There's no special supplies or equipment. You're going to be up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, and send it anywhere you want. Stop overpaying for your shipping with Stamps.com. Sign up with the promo code CURB for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. And there's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code CURB. Can I break in for a second about... so? I I love, so the point about the dentist for the audience, see our inpatient hypertension episode from just a little while ago where we talked about, you know, it's, it's not a normal place to measure blood pressure, certainly. Uh, Anyway, but as far as, as far as the, the, the KDGO guideline, which we'll talk about probably a little later when we talk about CKD, they mentioned this casual or routine blood pressure in that happens in the office. Like that's not really what our, our blood pressure goals and trials are based on standardized office blood pressure, right? But what you're saying is because it's hard to do that all the time and are often not actually standardized like textbook blood pressures that we get in the office, it's best to see what it is at home and sort of go by that, even though the randomized trials aren't really based on what the person's home blood pressure on it is, is on, which I thought was interesting. Exactly. And this is based on a couple of really good sources of evidence. One is Paul Draws published an amazing paper last year in JAMA Internal Medicine, where he collected all of the electronic health record data from everyone in Sprint that he could get it from. Mm -hmm. And he compared what their routine clinic blood pressure checks were compared to what their perfect Sprint blood pressures were. And you can't just like tack on a correction factor because the blood pressures were all over the place. There were people that had 20 millimeter mercury lower blood pressures in their routine clinic blood pressure checks and people that had 40 millimeter mercury higher ones. And so while the average was a bit higher in a routine clinic check, you can't just say, I'm going to add 10 millimeters mercury or add add five millimeters of mercury to a routine clinic check and say that estimates what a a really high quality uh, research quality blood pressure is. However, in studies where we look at home and ambulatory blood pressure, we get, a, we get closer to that perfect clinic blood pressure, especially that resting home one, because a resting home blood pressure um, really gets you in the same setting that you would be in doing a, a really perfect research measurement, as long as the patient's following the steps that they have to follow. And there are really, really great, um, great resources out there for training patients on how to do this in a patient-friendly way. Um, I really love the infographics at targetbp.org, which is a website put together by the American Medical Association and American Heart Association. They're pu- they're mostly graphic, very little text, and it just shows the patient this is exactly how you check your blood pressure right. Um, and I, I think that that's really the best thing we can do for our patients is to get them to start checking their blood pressures that way using a valid device. So for Tom here, he should get a device that goes on his upper arm that fits well and that can check multiple pr- multiple pressures uh, when he's at home automatically and then give an average of the blood pressure. Exactly. And ideally, a, a device that's listed on www.validatebp.org. That's the American Medical Association's uh, validated blood pressure listing. Um, full disclosure, I'm co-chair of it, but I don't get paid anything for doing it. So. <laughs> Can I ask, practically speaking, how, how are you counseling patients to check their blood pressure at home? I, I, I feel like oftentimes in clinic, I will see, okay, here's your blood. Go pick up a blood pressure cuff and just, just check a couple of times, then just call me and sort of let me know what it is. And like, we don't sort of give any counseling in terms of the, I guess my, my broader question is what kind of quality control are we doing for home blood pressure measurements or out of office blood pressure measurements? And then how do you specifically counsel patients to take them just so that we have data we can use effectively? Yeah, Edmund Ansi and uh, Dai Shishimbo did a great study showing that we need a, a minimum of three days of measurements. Really, the best, time, the best way to have them do it over those three days um, is to have two readings in the morning before they take their medication. Um, it's really good to tell people to just get up, empty your bladder, sit down at the breakfast table before you eat your breakfast and before you have your coffee, wait for five minutes and then check it. And then to check two in the evening, and they should just be two readings back to back right then. And then two in the in the evening before going to bed. Um, if you take any evening medication, same thing. It should be before you take any of those evening medications, roughly about 12 hours later, often more for some folks. Okay. So Tom's going to purchase a blood pr- pressure cuff, hopefully one that he saw on validatebp.org. Then he's going to check for at least three days, two readings in the morning, two readings at night once he's been like seated for five minutes at rest. And 
let's say that at home, um, I feel like this happens a lot. I mean, if, if his blood pressure is, is high like this, we know we're going to start. Like if I'm if we're if he's in the 150s or 160s over 90s to 100s, of course we're going to start him on medicines. But I think what happens a lot in these younger youngish folks is that they have these blood pressures that are kind of on the borderline enough that the can just keeps getting kicked down the road. So like the person that's in the 130s, 140s systolic, let's say he comes back to us and let's say his blood pressure was actually a little lower than what I initially gave you. And it's just both in the office and at home, he's 130s, 140s. How do you think about like the threshold for initiation in someone like that? So I'm going to give you two answers. One Mm -hmm. is the guideline answer and one is my answer. Sure. Um, So the guideline answer, especially ACCAHA guideline is this guy has probably no other risk factors. We're assuming that, you know, you checked him for everything like he asked. And, um, and, and he doesn't have hyperlipidemia. He doesn't have any, any other, he's not, not a smoker. Um, oh, then, he smokes half a pack, this guy. Oh, he does. I'm sorry. Yeah. You mentioned that. Okay. So that is a risk factor. I'd counsel him on stopping because that'll help. <laughs> counsel him on other lifestyle modifications, losing weight, try to get him to reduce sodium in his diet. We know how successful that is in many patients. Um, try to get him to increase potassium because that helps also. We often don't think about that, but um, fruits and vegetables go such a long way. Uh, in terms of uh, improving blood pressure. And and then once he's tried lifestyle modifications, tried other things, and he's still having an average blood pressure, if it's over 140 over 90, I would start medications. If it's under 140 over 90, I would just keep urging him, keep working on lifestyle, and that you should be okay. And that's really the threshold based off of the best guidelines and pretty consistent right now uh, for a young, healthy, low-risk person. There is no data on what we do in young, healthy, low risk or relatively low risk people. Um, He's he's not even he can't even go into our ASCVD risk calculators for cardiovascular risk because he's too young. Uh, We don't have any we never will have a randomized trial that's going to randomize people in their 30s to different blood pressure management strategies and then follow them 30 years or 40 years until they have that cardiac event or stroke or hopefully don't. Um, and so using the ob- best observational evidence is really challenging because most studies that are observational studies show you what someone's achieved blood pressure is. The blood pressure that somebody achieves on their own says a lot about who that person is. It's just very heavily confounded by how much do, am I engaged with healthcare? How much am I engaged in my own well, like my own health? What are my genetics? So many other factors. How did my doctor decide to treat me? But not necessarily that's usually like sort of lower on the rung compared to other things uh, in a lot of these observational studies. And so it's really hard to know in 30 year olds, like what the best thing to do is. Personally, my own bias, not based off of good evidence, is I I myself would want to have more stringent blood pressure control because I see how much it helps in so many other populations of patients that we do have trial evidence on. So I would want a blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80 myself. I have that conversation with my patients. I say, are you okay with being on a medication knowing that it might help reduce risk? your risk? We don't have any evidence to suggest that it would increase your risk in any way. Um, and if it does help reduce your risk, it could be something where it might prevent you from having a stroke or a heart attack 30 years down the line. Paul, what did, did you have any comments on this? I know earlier you were, because like the, what is it? The ACCHA. I have lots of comments. Yeah, go ahead. Let's hear it. <laughs> no, I, no, no, I, I just, I appreciate the point. Like, I, I just feel like it's a sort of like, I, I think the recommendations for if, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but sort of the stage one hypertension is uh, you do the ASCVD risk calculation with, which is not applicable to half the population that we're talking about in this particular um, theoretical thing. And then I think there was just a new scientific guidance released, if you want to call it that. Um, about how if you keep checking, because I think the, the recommendation is to check again. So the Paul Williams technique, keep checking until you get a number you like. <laughs> but in this case, if you don't if you don't achieve control with your recommendation of lifestyle management, then you could consider starting an antihypertensive even if the risk is low. Like it's just, it's all very nebulous and sort of, and I think it, it just reflects the lack of data around this particular patient population. But I, I guess maybe, maybe now's the time to transition into how you think or what you think about when starting a regimen. So let's say for this theoretically lower risk patient, um, what what agents would you consider? Like, I, I know, I, I guess we'll talk about this. I'm sorry to be running so long, but sort of there's concerns about thiazides increasing the risk for, for uh, I, I guess, diabetes. Like, so does that take them off the table as initial agents? Sort of what what medications do you think about when you're trying to achieve goal, goal blood pressure in these sort of lower risk patients? Yeah, my goal, my goal is to go really low because um, I want to minimize the risk of an adverse effect of a medication. Uh, so that's 
really important because I just said to them, hey, there's very little risk of me treating you, but you could have all this potential benefit that we're not sure about. Uh, so I, I think starting with low doses is key. Um, this is why there's been a lot of push for combination therapy, because the lower the dose that you start people on of a couple of different antihypertensives, the more likely you are to hit whatever the mechanism of their hypertension is, because it could be more sympathetically driven, it could be more RAS driven, could be more volume mediated, you don't know. Um, and, and the only way to know is to try empirically. Um, and so I, I really love low dose combination. Uh, my preference is to start with a low dose of a calcium channel blocker and an ARB because of uh, what you were alluding to. There is some theoretical risk of thiazide diuretics potentially increasing the risk of hyperglycemia, potentially increasing your risk of hyperlipidemia. It's not entirely perfectly clear, and there's some controversy over it because it doesn't impact long-term mortality risk and risk of actual heart events. Um, so we don't know if that's actually meaningful or not. Um, but I think just, you know, in case I, I try to start them on an ARB and a calcium channel blocker at like ha like very, very low doses, like two and a half of, of, of amlodipine. And my favorite is almost certain using like 10 milligrams um, and just start with that. Again, with our, our theoretical younger patient who's at who doesn't have a whole lot of comorbidities, I guess does that in terms of so something I struggle with is I feel like a lot of the times I'll see folks reach for an ACE or an ARB right just because they're easy to dose, more familiar with them. But for patients who may become pregnant, like is that a consideration? Do you have that conversation ahead of time? Sort of what does that discussion look like? Because I yeah, we didn't <laughs> mention whether Tom is M to F and whether Tom might pe potentially have a possibility of becoming pregnant, for example. And so it is something that if it's a feasibility in my patient, I would definitely mention to them that this medication is teratogenic and we need to, you need to take that into account if you are not on birth control or if there's a possibility you might stop your birth control, um, that you should stop that medication. And my question was going to be about the combination because I, I like combination pills. And when we talked to, with Dr. Von Padanassen last year about this, she was saying that, you know, Kaiser had done this. They use lisinopril 8CTZ just because it's cheap. And they would say, okay, take either a half a pill, full pill, or two pills, depending on, you know, your blood pressure control. But with with the combination calcium channel blocker and ARB, it, does does that is that something that is affordable or are you giving that as two separate pills in like a quarter of the maximum dose each? Yeah, so most of the combination ARB um, and calcium channel blocker or thiazide medications, they're all most of them are generic now. So they should in theory be covered by um, by insurance. Medicare and Medicaid cover many of these, um, but there are some insurance companies that will give me trouble and will not cover them, and they want you to just separate them. And they'll charge the patient less to separate them, even though it actually is more, there have been studies showing that it's more cost effective to do the combination ones. Um, so it's sort of a stupid decision on behalf of those insurance companies, for lack of a better term, but yeah. it's I, I go based <laughs> off of their insurance. Okay. And then, uh, and you said this out loud, and I, I just didn't want to let this move past without actually commenting on it. You mentioned almost certain being your favorite. Thank you, Paul. So, my follow-up question: Why? <laughs> a few reasons. So, <laughs> I'll um, I'll mention them briefly. One is uh, that it's very long acting, uh, and so I really love longer acting ARBs because they tend to minimize blood pressure liability better, more even for older patients who have stiffer blood pressures than for a younger patient. Um, but I think it's just good to sort of make that be their initial one because they'll be used to taking it. Um, Losartan has a shorter half-life. It's only about a, a four to six hour half-life. Um, and so it should technically be dosed twice daily. That's part of the, the actual packet labeling. And often it's not. Um, it is le often less expensive though. So whichever one is going to be the least expensive option and that will be fully covered, I recommend. But Losartan's generic and, and most of my patients haven't gotten charged when they go to pick up the script. So... Okay, audience, we we know that our our audience is just going to think because we we had this whole Twitter thing about, you know, who's going to be the first one to find Olmosard in enteropathy. So just uh, yes, audience, <laughs> it's it's a rare condition. We know there's an enteropathy, uh but but what about Valsartan? Uh is that one Valsartan, Losartan, Olmosardin? Those are those are I know there's others, but those are the three that I most commonly would see. Valsartan is just less potent. So I'm fine with it for someone where I'm not too worried about needing like maximum potency and then can just switch to uh, a stronger one later. Okay, great. So we- And then, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing is I didn't mention any ACE inhibitors. So just very, very briefly on that. Um, so I tend to prefer ARB over ACE inhibitors for a couple of reasons. Um, one being that just less risk of side effects. Um, ACE inhibitors have a much higher uh, risk of having angioedema and having- um, uh, cough. Uh, and this is something where if you end up getting that angioedema in particular, then you end up 
being very concerned about having people on this class in the future at all. Um, so many people, once they have the angioedema with an ACE inhibitor, you've now locked them out of an ARB unless they're really desperate. Uh, so that's really problematic. Try to avoid the ACE inhibitors mainly for that reason. Um, one other thing that I always mention is I tend to start with these in everybody. Um, there are some older uh, guidelines that, do, and even more recent guidelines that recommend that in Black patients that we should be starting that we should be starting with calcium channel blockers and thiazide diuretics, and that we shouldn't be using ACE inhibitors or ARBs as our first line. Um, that's based off of uh, a few different studies, one being, for example, a post hoc analysis of the All Hat trial, which was our really biggest first line antihypertensive trial uh, from the 90s. And that one had shown that in patients who were Black who had received um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs as their first line agent, that they had a little bit of a higher risk of stroke. Um, the issue is that these studies are older. These studies didn't do a really good job of how to even define race. Um, race as it is is a social construct, and we really should be thinking very carefully about how we use it in medicine. I learned a lot from my colleague Amaka and Yanya on this topic and thinking really carefully about how I should even ascribe to my patient what their race is. Um, it really shouldn't be my role to do that. Um, but in general, in, in a patient like this, if we know that they're, these medications are incredibly effective and have been shown to reduce risk in the large populations and we could be potentially causing harm by not prescribing them more, um, that there's a lot to lose by not using them um, in exchange for a few studies that we're not quite sure if we can rely upon um, that had suggested that they might not be as good as others. Uh, so I tend to err towards sticking with the ACE and ARBs because we know that they are just such great agents. Um, more ARBs than ACE. Um, but the other important thing to think about, though, is if we do are worried about causing harm, is that um, ACE, inhibitors and ACE inhibitors tend to have higher rates of cough and angioedema in Black patients um, than they do in white patients. And so that is an important thing, though, that I think we can do to protect these patients, is if we could potentially be causing harm by prescribing more ACEs, why not just always prescribe the ARB? Thank you for that. And I, I know Paul and I had talked about this before on some previous episodes uh, based on that. And Paul was telling me his practice has largely changed to he ARBs are now the first line for most of the patients. And the, they're now generic, so the cost has been taken out as a factor. Um, in the past, they were more expensive, so that's why so many people were on ACEs. And I think maybe moving forward, you'll it will probably just naturally switch over with some of these coming out, um, you know, all this information coming out about the side effects and just the safety profile so much better. This episode of The Curbsiders is brought to you in part by Squarespace. You are listening to a podcast, so I assume you know what Squarespace is, but just in case, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and to run your business smoothly and efficiently. All of the websites designed on Squarespace are optimized for mobile content. So what that means is that the content automatically adjusts so your site looks great on any device. Squarespace also offers powerful analytics so you can see who's been visiting your website, how they're interacting with your content. They offer things like in-depth analytics tools that include page views, traffic sources, how much time is spent on your site, uh, audience geography, and more. The Squarespace blogging platform also supports a configurable sharing button so that your visitors can share their content with, uh, I don't know, their aunts on Facebook, with their friends on Twitter. They can share with their colleagues on LinkedIn, with whoever on Reddit, and on and on. So if this sounds appealing to you, I'd like you to go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash curb to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, that is squarespace.com forward slash curb to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Folks, let me tell you a little bit about Green Chef. Green Chef is the milk kit company that makes eating well easy. They have plans to fit every lifestyle, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or if you're just looking to eat more balanced meals, Green Chef offers a range of recipes to suit your preferences. Green Chef makes cooking easy, so you can spend less time stressing and more time just enjoying eating these home-cooked meals. You don't have to sweat the grocery store. Instead, Green Chef sends you these hand-picked organic vegetables. They send you premium protein so you can feel good about what you're eating and how it got to your table. It is so convenient. They send you pre-portioned, easy-to-follow recipes. They're delivered to your door. You also get pre-made and pre-measured sauces, dressings, and spices. They get you that chef-curated flavor in less time. I think two things to know about me is I really I love to cook, and also I spend much of my life being exhausted. So with Green Chef, to get all the annoying stuff already taken care of, so the shopping is done, the ingredients are measured, the sauces are pre-made, 
I'm left with the fun stuff. So I get to, I get to enjoy putting a meal together, and then I get to enjoy eating this fantastic meal that changes on a week to week basis. So if this sounds appealing to you, I'm going to ask you to go to greenchef.com slash curb130 and use code curb130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. Again, that is greenchef.com slash curb130. Use the code curb130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. That's Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Jordy, I want to bring it back to Tom. And let's just say that their blood pressure is... If it was 140 over 90s, like 140s over 90s, versus if it was 150s to 160s over 90s to 100s, do you think about, like, do you ever do monotherapy as initial therapy? Or are you always jumping to to two agents at a, to, to start off? Like, how do you think about that initial prescription for blood pressure? Yeah, I think in the patients with that really borderline blood pressure, um, I suggested the fixed dose combination at a low dose because I really like that Mm. um, to potentially get at it. It's not quite as necessary in that 130 to 140 patient as it is in that 150 to 160 patient. Um, 130 to 140, if you really want to just start them on a low dose of amlodipine because less need to check labs and just you want to just get them on a little bit of something, I think that's okay. Um, whereas in that 150, 160 patient, they're really going to benefit from a fixed dose combination because that person is a true hypertensive. We really don't know the, the etiology of their hypertension. It may be multifactorial. Uh, and so if you can get a couple of different complementary mechanisms of their hypertension by using that fixed dose combination, I think you're really going to help benefit them. Um, it also helps to prevent you from having to go to those maximum doses early. Um, for instance, if we think of amlodipine, when I think of amlodipine 10 milligrams daily, the first thing that pops into my mind isn't blood pressure control, it's edema. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> I just I, I, we know that these medications at higher doses give you less bang for their buck with regard to blood pressure control. The pharmacokinetic studies don't show that it, when you go from 5 to 10, you get double the blood pressure effect. When you go to, from 5 to 10, you don't get that much additional blood pressure benefit for the, with amlodipine, but you get a lot more edema. Um, And it's the same with every antihypertensive medication. Most of your benefit comes at that median dose um, of of antihypertensive medication. And anything you go above that, you'll get additional benefit. Um, But it's going to be at the expense of higher risk of adverse effects. So I've come to start to think of blood pressure meds as like quarter dose or half dose or full dose. And a lot of the times, like you're saying, I, I would start someone on quarter dose of two agents and then next step would be to sort of maybe go up either on both of them or one of them to half dose. And before I go to full dose, usually I have them on half dose of two agents. I'm not sure if that's a reasonable thing to do um, or if you think of it a different way just when people are titrating after that first visit. 100% agree, uh, except I think that people have the wrong uh, dose in mind with hydrochlorothiazide often. Mm-hmm. For some reason, everyone, uh, like the drug companies were always selling 12 and a half milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide in these fixed dose combinations. That's like a tenth of a dose. <laughs> um, that's, um, I'm exaggerating, but it's really a homeopathic dose. It's really not effective at managing blood pressure. So unless it's a little old lady that you're really worried is going to have incontinence or gout, or gout flare from it, um, that's really not the dose we should be using. Um, we should be starting with 25 of hydrochlorothiazide. The other ones, I agree, start really low and go slow. And chlorothaladone, is that a 12.5 starting dose, 25 uh, full dose? Or how do, how do you think of that one? Yeah. So I fully agree uh, with chlorothaladone, 12 and a half starting dose, except it's really hard to break it in half because it's such a tiny pill. Um, I was on the Freely Filtered podcast. I'm, I'm occasionally a, 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 a one of the members of that podcast, not, not, a, not consistently. Um, and we had Rajiv Agarwal on, who was the lead author of the Click study, which we will talk about in a little bit. Um, and they used chlorthalidone in that study. And he was saying that in his patients, he often just gives them one pill every other day because it's got yes. such a long half-life. Um, I've never tried doing that, so I can't tell you whether I can attest to it. I usually just tell my patients, try to break it in half. And it's okay if it's not if you don't get a full half. Yeah. Um, if you get like one third, two thirds, it's totally fine because, it, again, it's such a long half-life. You'll just get some of it covered. And basically, it reaches a, set, a steady state because it's such a long-acting medication that it tends to prevent any wide swings anyway um, once you're on it consistently. So just th- that half dose is great of the chlorthalidone. Um, and we need to just shout, shout from the rooftops to try to convince these generic drug companies to start selling a 12 and a half milligram pill so we can just right. do what we would like to do. Yeah. 
I I have done the I have done the twenty five every other day. In some patients, actually, one of my patients actually just started doing that on their own, and it was it was working okay. I mean, that's anecdotally my couple patients. Joel told us that years ago that that you know that's you, he's like you could even get away dosing it every other day because it's so long acting, and you know uh, a, a small frail person if he was going to use it, he was going to use a low dose and maybe even every other day. So anyway, I think we should probably move on to. So let's let's tie things up for Tom here. So actually, Tom did great. We put him on uh, a half dose of two agents, a calcium, like five of amlodipine, and what is it, 20 of olmosartan? Is that half dose for that one? I'm not, I actually uh, don't know the max. Is totally, 10 is 10, totally fine. And 10 of So Olmosartan. usually the median dose is 20, the maximum dose is, is 40 for olmosartan, yeah. Okay. And, and he did great. And now let's move on. I just want to see another common scenario that comes up in clinic. This is Betsy. She's a community dwelling, 75 year old woman. BMI is only 24. Past medical history doesn't have much. She takes a cholesterol medicine and she says, I think I have low bone density. And her home blood pressure, commonly 120s, 130s, over 70s, 80s. But whenever she's in your clinic, it's always like 170s over 90s. And you are like, do I need to be treating this person's blood pressure? Are they going to have a stroke? Like, do I trust what's happening at home? So how do you suss out these patients where you're like, they swear they have white coat hypertension and you kind of believe them, but you also are kind of scared that they're going to have an event? This is like my quintessential referral. Um, So we see a lot of this. We see a lot of really severe white coat hypertension in older women. Um, and I, I always think of older women with the, the the difference of what their home and office blood pressure is directly proportional to their age. <laughs> um, and I think it, it's a lot to do with the arterial stiffness. And if there's a little bit of anxiety involved with the arterial stiffness, it goes a long way. Uh, and so we see this a lot. Um, I had I was actually the first author of the meta analysis that came out in Annals of Internal Medicine, I think two three years ago, on white coat hypertension and its cardiovascular risk. And what we found is that once you're on blood pressure medication, um, it, there isn't an elevated risk of adverse cardiovascular events to white coat hypertension. If you are not on antihypertensive medication, though, there is a small increased risk of cardiovascular events. It's not nearly as big of the risk as having uncontrolled hypertension. It's about a 30% increased risk of adverse events, as opposed to like two to threefold increased risk of having a stroke or, or cardiac event if you are on, um, if you're not controlled at all. But it's still it's still important, um, and so we st- still should be thinking about it. And we also found that the degree of blood pressure difference um, from your office blood pressure to your home blood pressure wasn't really associated with increased with like differences in risk. Um, we didn't publish that. I got a bunch of questions after the study was done and looked at that. Um, but so I, I think that even if it's in the 170s in the office, um, in theory, if she were already on blood pressure medication, uh, that there wouldn't be an elevated risk because she's not. I would really watch her very closely. Um, I don't want to make her fall at home by having her start an antihypertensive medication when she's walking around in the 120s and you suddenly put her down into the like 90s to 100s. Um, so uh, the, honestly, a patient like this, I would do 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring because the one thing you could be missing could be that it's not just white coat, that it's just that when she sits down and checks the blood pressure, it's great, but then the rest of the time is all over the place. Um, and so that she could have very labile hypertension or she could have really horrible um, nocturnal hypertension, for example. And those are all things where you'd want to get her on a nice, cautious, long-acting medication to help prevent that liability. Um, and that w- then she could benefit from it. So she's like the poster child for someone who would benefit from 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Paul, I think you covered this article uh, on a on a hotcakes like way back. I'm pretty sure we covered yeah, this. Yeah, no, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah, I love this article. Yeah, yeah that that's it's. I mean, it was just I thought of as just purely benign for so long. And I think is is this the same article? It might be thinking of something else that actually sort of looked at the mass hypertension um, conferring such significant risk as well. That was the Banagas one, yeah. And then um, the mass hypertension, uh, that one was unfortunately retracted, the Banagas one. But a lot of studies have shown that mass hypertension is hugely high risk, and that was what I was first thinking about with Tom. Because mass hypertension is actually really much more common in young men who are smokers. Um, that's like one of the, like there are very few risk factors for it. And that's one of them. Um, but that idea of having that normal office blood pressure, but an elevated blood pressure the rest of the time is something that we miss a lot. It's present in up to about 25% of people. Um, and it's a ticking time bomb. So yeah. this is just why it's so important that people just be measuring their blood pressure more. All right. Well, let's go to case number two. Paul, would you care to do the honors here? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, this patient's name is Pauline. She's a 62-year-old female with high blood pressure, CKD4, 
uh, with less than 500 milligrams of albuminuria per 24 hours. She is not on dialysis and has obesity with a body mass index of 32, history of CAD with a PCI done five years ago, type 2 diabetes on nighttime glargine and weekly dilaglutide. And she uses CPAP nightly. She has one plus putting edema of the lower extremities when we examine her. Her blood pressure is consistently 140 to 150 systolic over 90s diastolic on unloaded pain of 10 milligrams daily, um, which might explain the pitting edema. She is not on an ACE or an ARB or diuretics for fear that it might hasten her decline in GFR. Her PCP thinks that maybe hydralazine or a beta blocker might be a next reasonable option for her, but they, they feel a little bit stuck. So they're referring her um, for our expert eyes. So for this patient who has CKD4 and is on a couple of agents with some other agents being not considered as highly just because of potential risk factors, what how do you how do you approach a patient like this? I, I love this case because this is just such a common referral that I get of we don't have this patient on any other medications because I'm really worried they're going to increase or they're going to increase their creatinine or lower their EGFR. Uh, and this is just completely the approach we need people to to break out of. Um, it's this really unfortunate heuristic that people have that where they think of ACE inhibitors and ARBs and, thi and diuretics as being potentially harmful to the kidney, and they're not. Um, these are our protective, very excellent medications for controlling blood pressure in people with kidney disease, and they do not cause harm. Um, and we don't have any evidence that they cause harm. We just know that they can increase creatinine, but it's not necessarily getting patients to end-stage kidney disease faster. It's just reducing the load on the kidney, and it's basically unmasking what their true creatinine is because you're just getting them to better blood pressure control, so you're reducing the amount of hyperfiltration in the kidneys. Uh, and so really, this patient should be on a lot more other medication. And so in terms of thinking about which medication, um, so she's somebody who has less than 500 milligrams of albuminuria. Um, we could, we didn't have to do a 24 hour urine collection on this poor lady because that's a whole lot of work for her. <laughs> um, would have been totally okay to just do a spot urine microalbumin, uh, which is our most accurate measurement of how much protein she would have in her urine. If it's between 30 and 300, it's microalbuminuria. If she has more than 300, uh, then she, she ends up having macroalbuminuria. Um, and honestly, any of those patients will benefit from an ACE inhibitor or ARB. It has a lot of cardiovascular benefit in these patients. And the thing that patients with kidney disease um, are most at risk for isn't necessarily that progression of kidney disease to end-stage kidney disease, but more so it's the risk of cardiovascular disease. Our patients with kidney disease die a lot more from cardiovascular disease than they do from complications of their kidney disease. Um, so she really has a lot to benefit from being on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, um, preferably, as we talked before, an ARB. Um, so even, even if she weren't proteinuric, I still do it. Um, the reason for proteinuria is that there's evidence supporting that um, in patients who have more mild chronic kidney disease, that it would reduce her risk of progression of her kidney disease. Can um, I break in about the, yeah. you, you mentioned that we're worried about the creatinine increasing. I think also for me, CKD4, like potassium can be an issue, yeah. you know, if they're starting from a potassium of 4.5 and then you're going to add an ACE or an ARB, is that a major consideration for you too? And then can you talk about what's acceptable with, with, with both the potassium and the creatinine once you start an agent? Yeah, Really great point. And so with the creatinine, um, we accept up to a 30% increase in creatinine or a 30% decline in EGFR is acceptable. Um, honestly, if we do see an increase in creatinine or a decline in EGFR with that improvement in blood pressure, uh, we consider that a sign of therapeutic efficacy, that the medication is doing its job. Um, not everyone will say that, but there's a lot of really good evidence to support that. Uh, and the guidelines support that as well. Um, in terms of um, the potassium, though, that's a really great point. And then a lot of these patients, that's the reason they're no longer on ACE inhibitors and ARBs is that they ended up in trouble with hyperkalemia. Um, I will say that uh, it, we now have potassium binders that are safer that we can put patients on to allow them to be on ACE inhibitors and ARBs longer, but it has to be a careful conversation, thought, and discussion about whether or not you want to create a polypharmacy situation uh, to allow them to be on this medication. Um, so it depends on what she, her life has to like has to give her. Is she somebody who's got a lot, like a lot of lifespan left and who really has a lot of goals, like has a really good quality of life? And you want to make sure that she's going to live the longest and have the least risk of cardiovascular event. And that's like what her her goal is, too. Then I, I try to be aggressive and get her on an ACE inhibitor. And if she needs it, a, 
something like sodium zirconium or um, or one of our new potassium binders. Um, and if she's somebody who's more like, you know what, doc, I really don't want to deal with all these pills. I'm fine how I am. Like, I'm not too worried about this and understands the risk. Um, then I instead actually would probably try uh, just putting her on a diuretic instead. That, that was exactly where I was going to go with this, because that you would think that the diuretics would be an appealing way to kind of manage the potassium. But then there's also, I feel like there had been dogma from my training that you, you, you lost efficacy with the thiazide specifically as CKD progressed, though it sounds like maybe the, the thinking on that has evolved. And then there's also, as I think as we alluded to in this case, the concern that you might just send someone crashing into end-stage renal disease if you start up a, a loop diuretic. So how do you think about diuretics in patients that are at this stage in, of, of their CKD? Grossly underutilized. Um, yep, so <laughs> I think, uh, they're great. And so we just had the click trial came out of New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so one of our exciting nephrology trials, it's actually a positive trial. So <laughs> oh my God. <gosh, laughs> we're decade. getting a whole slew of them now. So suddenly maybe there'll be more interest in nephrology. Um, and so the click trial was this really exciting trial, uh, published by Rajiv Agarwal's group out of Minnesota that randomized patients to, um, receiving either chlorthaladone or placebo who had advanced chronic kidney disease. Uh, and these patients did great on chlorthaladone. Their blood pressure was better controlled. They tolerated it really well. And we really, it's evidence to support what we've been doing anyway, that we should be using more thiazide diuretics, specifically chlorthaladone in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease. Um, the old heuristic, which wasn't supported by any data, had been that thiazide diuretics no longer work once you reach advanced chronic kidney disease because they just can't get to your renal tubules. They can no longer get to enough tissue to actually function. And that's why you needed loop diuretics. Uh, and that's not the case. We've now proven it otherwise. So this is a great tool in our toolbox and it'll help a lot with calioresis. So it'll help you urinate out more potassium so that if you are having issues with hyperkalemia, uh, that can, that can partially address it. Um, we do use loop diuretics a lot for antihypertensives in these medications, in these patients too, though. And I have some patients that are on both chlorthaladone and torsamide, um, to help with their blood pressure management and chronic kidney disease. A lot of chronic kidney disease involves hiding of fluid. It's not just the edema because I can tell you her one plus pitting edema could be from her amlodipine too, as I already mentioned. Um, but they hide it elsewhere. They hide it in their abdomens. They hide it in places that we don't easily see it. Um, and so we, we really are often underutilizing um, diuretics in these patients for their hypertension management. Okay. I want to swing back on a couple things. So some loose ends from the a ACE inhibitor or ARB, when we're starting it, you said 30% increase. So if someone had a creatinine of two, and it went as long as it didn't go higher than like 2.6, which would be a 30 point, a 30 percent increase. We're okay, but if it goes to yeah. like from two to three, which is more than a 30 percent increase, then we would potentially just not use that agent. Is it correct? Okay, and that would also be an indicator to me that I might have missed her cause of kidney disease because she's non proteinuric and we don't have any um, indication of any of other frank causes for her. Because usually people who have kid uh, who have kidney disease due to diabetes are often more, are more often proteinuric. They mm -hmm. don't have to be. You can definitely have uh, kidney disease from diabetes that you, where you don't have a lot of proteinuria. Okay, but in someone who's advanced as her, I would expect like two or three grams of proteinuria per day. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she might have renal artery stenosis if her creatinine jumped that much. And so if we see more than a 30% increase in creatinine upon starting an ACE or ARB, that's a suggestion to us that someone might have renal artery stenosis, if anything, probably bilateral renal artery stenosis. And those are the patients that actually might benefit from an intervention for their renal artery stenosis because it help, could help prolong the time before she would end up needing to start dialysis. And if her potassium went from 4.5 to 5.2, is that a deal breaker for you? Is is no. like 5.5 .5 your threshold before you start to get nervous? Yeah, 5.5 .5 is my exact threshold actually before I start to get nervous with kidney disease patients because they tend to um, really get used to a little bit of a higher potassium. And if anything, um, we, we need to be okay with that. It's not going to harm them to have a potassium of 5. If she jumped to 5.5 .5 from like 4.3, I would be a little worried that she's somebody who's really potassium avid and that that I could like be missing if it jumps up to six. But um, if she's in the low fives, I would have no problem with it whatsoever. 
Um, and even if she's in the mid fives, I might say, did I try too high of a dose? Can I go to a little bit of a lower dose um, and see if she tolerates that and add on the diuretic with that if her blood pressure is still high? Paul, I'm getting bolder by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. all, of this requi- all of it requires close monitoring. That's the key. Yeah. Um, and it's tough right now, especially with COVID. I have a lot of patients where I've been doing some tough titrations and Oof. I'd like yeah. to get labs every couple of weeks after a big change. And they're saying, well, can I put it off another couple of weeks? And so it's it's tough, and especially I mean, it's a big burden on patients to have to get labs often when we make these changes. But I think it's still important because it's going to be the way that we're going to help to reduce their long term risk and help to try to keep them off of dialysis as long as possible too. Another thing I wanted to just comment on in the click trial, I believe a lot of the patients were on a loop diuretic, uh, yeah. and and so and then the chlorthaladone was added. Can you talk about what's a typical dose of a torsamide or furosemide? in a patient with CKD4 that you would use for blood pressure, and then the comment on the chlorthaladone dose as well? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so for I've t- I mentioned torsamide before because I tend to prefer torsamide. Um, I, I'm somebody who favors longer-acting medications, if you haven't noticed, because I think they really help to reduce both burden on patients because they only have to take medications once yeah. a day, but also to reduce blood pressure like liability that. because right. a lot of what we run into with medications is when they run out, the patient becomes more sodium avid later in the day just like what you see with hydrochlorothiazide and they end up hypertensive overnight while they're sleeping, which is a really, really major risk factor for stroke. And so that's the, I prefer torsamide. I tend to usually start these patients. I'll usually start them a little bit low around 20 uh, and then go up. Um, if I have them on furosemide or, bu- or bumetanide, um, because that's just what they tend to be started on by their cardiologist or somebody else, not me. <laughs> um, I, I tend to prefer not having them on furosemide because the absorption and pharmacokinetics aren't as good in these patients, but it's just our heuristic. Everyone loves it. So try to get them on bumetanide, in which case I would start them on one twice a day usually um, and titrate up from there. Um, mm-hmm. If they're on furosemide, I wouldn't go with a lower dose than than 20 to 40 twice a day. Um, I'd, I'd never start a patient like this on 10 twice a day, which is what I think most people get started on in other, uh, with other levels of kidney function. You're reminding me the first time I think I fully realized that we didn't do things evidence-based is way back when I was a resident talking to a cardiologist about the difference between furosemide and bumetanide. I'm like, wait, so bumetanide, better bioavailability. They're like, yep. And I'm like, and it seems to be as efficacious, like, absolutely. I'm like, then why do we do furosemide all the time? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, oh, okay. We've so always just, done yeah, it that way, do. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> what, and, and chlorthaladone dose 25 to 50, is that, is that the dose? Like, also, do you yeah. start at, at 25 in these, in these folks as well? I usually start at 25, especially with this patient's blood pressure is in the 140s, 150s. I'm not worried about tipping her over. If it's someone who has who's really, really prone to gout flares and I haven't, like I, I would make sure to optimize their allopurinol dosing first and make sure that you're really trying to minimize their adverse effects from diuretics before maximizing these diuretics. Um, but uh, but other than that, I, I would okay. I would go with that. So what I'm hearing is audience, uh, we, we don't have to be afraid of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. If the creatinine bumps more than 30%, think about renal artery stenosis. And, uh, you know, that might be a reason that we might need to stop them, but otherwise a little bit of a bump in the creatinine or decrease in GFR is okay. We do need close monitoring for creatinine and potassium threshold can be up up to 5.5. Uh, and then we can use loop diuretics, torsamide uh, or furosemide, bumetanide, but the shorter acting ones have to be dosed twice a day. And then chlorthaladone um, is a is a good choice and could even be used potentially in combination with a loop in these folks based on the click trial. Any com- any agree. any comments on that? And then wh- what about this amlodipine? I put at her on amlodipine in this case, but. I know that for if she had more proteinuria, would you think about putting her on a different calcium channel blocker? Yeah, that's a really great question. And so, um, so dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like amlodipine and nifedipine actually increase renal uh, hyperfiltration just a little bit. Um, and they can actually promote a little bit of worsening of proteinuria, but it doesn't usually, it hasn't been demonstrated to affect long-term renal endpoints. It's only been associated with better cardiac endpoints because your blood pressure is better controlled. Um, so I don't think there's enough evidence to support stopping it because it's a more, it's a more potent antihypertensive medication than your non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like deltiazem and verapamil. 
However, diltiazem is associated with a reduction in proteinuria. And so this is something that we keep in our back pocket, especially before the time of SGLT2 inhibitors um, in proteinuric patients, where if they couldn't tolerate an ACE inhibitor or ARB, or if they were on maximum dose of ACE inhibitor or ARB and still were very proteinuric, and were also on maximum dose of a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist or couldn't tolerate a higher dose due to hyperkalemia, um, then that's when I would add on diltiazem um, because it does help a bit with, with um, proteinuria. Um, but it's not a great anti hypertensive agent, not very potent. And this lady needs blood pressure control. I think I'd keep her on her medication, mm-hmm. maybe lower the dose a little if we get her optimized on the other ones to help see if that helps the edema. It sounds like hydralazine and the beta blocker that her PCP was thinking about probably would be fourth or fifth line agents for, for yeah. a patient like her. Yeah, definitely. Uh, great point. So I would honestly, if her potassium can tolerate it, I would put her on a, a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist before I would put her on hydralazine or a beta blocker. But off, that it, sometimes the three diuretics is too much. Um, so I would yeah. probably do that or a loop. Probably send um, her your way if uh, if before I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I hate hydralazine. I almost never use hydralazine. I think um, uh, the IV form obviously never, and that you had in the in the uh, yes. hospitalization uh, uh, episode, but. Um, the PO form even, it's it worsens blood pressure liability. Patients hate it. They feel horrible on it, and they don't always realize that that's why they're feeling horrible. Um, and as soon as you stop it, they feel great. Um, but one of my more common consults is this patient has severe labile hypertension and stop the uh, hydralazine and switch them to something long acting and it fixes it. Um, it's also going to worsen her edema because it's a potent vasodilator. Um, and then beta blockers aren't great antihypertensive agents either. Um, if you're going to use one, I, I do like carvedilol because it has that combined um, alpha beta activity, but it's twice a day. And so now you're, you're, now you're complicating their regimen. Um, and it shouldn't be used before you've maxed out their diuretics and really managed their volume. Um, these, these patients aren't going to benefit from it unless they have a history of an MI or they've got atrial fibrillation. Like it should not be your like go-to antihypertensive agent. And Paul, what do you think about the KDGO goal of less than 120 over 80? I have no strong feelings about <laughs> it. I, I understand where it comes from. Um, I, I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I think we should probably ask yeah. Jordi what she thinks about it as she's our hypertension no, expert. No, I was just I was just mentioning like in your patients with CK, I, I will say that uh, I'll say for me, with my, a lot of my patients with CKD4, I would struggle to meet that goal. I'm not sure if you feel the same, Paul. This felt like your usual trick to try to get me to be sued, but yeah, no, one hundred percent. I have a hard time getting patients to that goal, even in the best of circumstances. So I, it's, it's, I, I understand the data to support it. I also have a hard time getting there. So I agree with you. There was actually a study that came out, one of those post hoc sprint uh, studies that showed that like CKD patients were the ones that it was hardest to get to the intensive goal in. Um, and so, and there's some evidence that the more medications you have to use to get someone to a blood pressure goal, the higher risk they just inherently are. Um, and so I just, I, I love that it, it's representative of how do we reduce people's long-term cardiovascular uh, adverse events. Like that's what it's showing. And there it's truly efficacious to get a patient to a lower blood pressure with chronic kidney disease to reduce their long-term cardiovascular risk. There's some evidence that it might worsen other risk factors, might worsen some adverse effects. So you have to balance that in each patient. Um, and you got to make sure that you really trust that blood pressure. <laughs> yeah. I, I've i kind of resolved to, if I, I, I try, I know lower in general is better with blood pressure um, and usually too low isn't a problem in my practice. So I, I try to do my best. And at some point the patient usually taps out like, oh yeah, you think you're starting another blood pressure medicine. You are not like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm happy with 130 over 80 or whatever it is at that point. And uh, usually then I concede. But if you could, if you could get them lower, like under one twenty over eighty, that's that's the goal. I just I just wanted to call it out that the KDGO does have a guideline, very nice guideline, really nice figures in the guideline as well. Um, and it, the but the goal is, I think it's it's going to be hard for us to hit in primary care, but we should at least be aware of it. My unofficial opinion on it, um, not in all these other committees that I'm on where we're saying this is like the best thing ever, um, but my, my unofficial opinion is that I think that it's a sort of paternalistic approach to try to get people thinking 120s over 80s are what we should be getting. Um, because I think uh, it's just we need to shift our Overton window to where we're expecting 120s over 80s as opposed to expecting 140s over 90s. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I will say, you know, it's and I, I'm glad that we mentioned the lifestyle stuff and the sodium reduction, and the high potassium and all that kind of stuff. I, I think we do that initially. And then once we get to the medication stage, it's easy to forget about those things and kind of back off talking about those things. So actually, Matt, in the case that you mentioned, I, I find the same thing too, where patients are like, okay, I think I'm good here. Like, and then that's a great time to circle back and be like, wait, you know, how good am I doing with the sleep apnea? Have we talked? It's probably time to go back and actually talk about sort of what your dietary intake looks like. So it's, it's, sometimes it's a nice opportunity to go back and revisit the therapeutic lifestyle changes that I I may have sort of stepped off the brake as I started moving towards medication management. So to round things out with Pauline, let's say we actually lower her dose of amlodipine a little bit. We put her on Olmosard in 10 milligrams. She does great. Blood pressure is better and she has less edema now. And uh, eventually we're fine tuning things. So we have her on a little bit of torsamide as well, still doing great. And, and now she's happy. We're happy. We get her close to the KDGO goal that we just talked about. And now let's go to another case. This is a case uh, of refractory, more refractory blood pressure. So Peter, 60-year-old, has obesity, BMI of 30, high cholesterol on, on uh, statin, has BPH, not taking any meds for it though, has high blood pressure, currently on hydralazine three times a day, carvedilol twice a day, losartan, and amlodipine. Occasionally he has ankle swelling at the end of the day, but it's usually gone in the morning. He was previously on hydrochlorothiazide, but he thought it affected the BPH, like lower urinary tract stuff, so stopped it. And blood pressure today is 155 over 95. He's adherent to the medications. Home readings are pretty consistent, like 140s, 160s, 80s to 100. And uh, the PCP sends him to you, Jordy, because clearly this is a case that is above, you know, it's it's not your average blood pressure case. Well, it's probably your average, but not for me and Paul, fortunately. <laughs> Yeah, this is another really common referral that I get. And that blood pressure regimen just pains me when I see it. And I understand. That was intentional. I feel for for the primary care doctors dealing with getting the person to the stage. And and you you don't have 20 minutes to sit there and talk talk to the person about why a diuretic will be helpful for them. And they don't want to hear it. Um, And so I think there's a lot of really great takeaways to be taken from this case. First and foremost, we have to ask the question, of course, like, is this, is his blood pressure really optimally controlled? And can we judge those blood pressures? Um, obviously, he's not on optimal management without being on a diuretic because he should be to be considered somebody who has true resistant hypertension. You have to be somebody who has an elevated blood pressure on three antihypertensive medications that are optimally dosed. Um, these sort of are. <laughs> he's on four. <laughs> um, but it's it's not including a diuretic. There's controversy as to whether you have to include a diuretic in that definition. And so uh, he's, he's made it to four. So we'll say he's on four. He's, he's officially resistant resistant hypertensive if we really trust he's checking his home blood pressure as well and we trust our office reading was done appropriately. Um, and how do we trust that? We just check him. We ask quickly, tell me, like, bring in your blood pressure cuff and ch- come show me how you checked it. Um, and that'll be your second check in the office. Um, and 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 so I, I think with him, I, I, I he truly has resistant hypertension. He needs an evaluation for why is his blood pressure so hard to control. Um, and the key things that we really have to be thinking about with somebody in this are, does he have obstructive sleep apnea? Does he have chronic kidney disease? Does he have, first and foremost, primary aldosteronism? Um, and so he is the, 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 the poster child for somebody that we should be checking arena and aldo on. So let me, yeah, let me give you some more information. He's a, he has mild sleep apnea. AHI is only five, doesn't really have significant desaturations. Um, he does not drink alcohol, take NSAIDs. He's not like using any stimulants, just has like a morning, a cup of coffee or two in the morning. Renin is suppressed and his aldosterone level is 12. So what do you make of these? And what, what sort of labs would you send? Did we miss anything that you would have sent in addition to what I told you? I'm sure this was already checked because of the medications he's on. He's on Losartan. I'm sure you had a basic metabolic panel. And I would, in all of these patients, I check a urinalysis in a, in a urine microalbumin, which I know isn't uh, guideline based and isn't recommended. Um, but it's just such an inexpensive test. And uh, if we can capture k- kidney disease early, either as a target organ damage in these patients or um, as, um, as a cause of their hypertension, I think it's just helpful because it lets us sort of frame our thinking of how we're going to manage them. And what do you think, is it necessary to send, would you have sent these same things or 
I, I know there's been some recent stuff about the aldosterone levels are not necessarily like a single plasma aldosterone is not necessarily reliable. Maybe we should be doing urinary excretion of aldosterone, or maybe we should just be looking whether the renin suppressed and starting based on that. How are you thinking about it these days? Like what would you have sent as a second round test? And let's say the potassium was 3.5, creatinine was 1.4, nothing too, nothing too crazy in either case. Yeah, but I mean, to me, a potassium th- uh, in the threes is poster child of primary hyperaldo. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I would. Definitely but it wasn't red, Jordy. It, d- it just said it was normal. <laughs> so, okay, so enlighten us. Yeah, I mean, he's on an ACE inhibitor, and he's got that low of, okay. of and he's got a creatinine three point of one point four, and he's got that low of potassium. That's a red flag to me that he is um, in some way has aldosterone excess. Um, but, but yeah, I, I wouldn't check a cortisol necessarily unless he's diabetic and has some central obesity and some other, um, uh, signs of potentially having Cushing's. Um, but I would definitely have checked that initial renin and aldo. Uh, there are some concerns that the testing is unreliable, but, and, but honestly, if, if a patient is has aldosterone excess, whether or not they've got true primary aldo or just have too much aldo or too much aldosterone hanging around because their volume overloaded, you're gonna see a suppressed renin, um, and it, it, it's it's very very hard to overcome that suppressed renin with medications. It's very hard to to not capture it in a true aldo excess state. This patient's on losartan and which can and amlodipine, which can increase renin a little bit. Um, their carvedilol can also reduce it a little bit. So he's he's in a state where it's gonna balance each other out. Um, if I see that suppressed renin, which you saw, I'm thinking immediately this guy has some aldosterone excess, is salt sensitive, is volume overloaded. Um, whether or not that aldosterone is high, I'm still going to be thinking about that. Um, he's somebody who's had probably hypertension for many, many years. He's someone who, when I sit down and have that conversation about whether or not he'd really want surgery if he had primary aldo, I don't even expect that he would probably be interested in going through the next steps, but I could be wrong. So I always have the conversation. Um, but let's say he's not. Um, he's somebody that even without having a really elevated, al- super elevated aldosterone, um, that I'm still pretty convinced he's got salt sensitivity, if not primary aldo. Well, with the aldosterone, his aldosterone is 12. Typically, they say 15, more than 15, certainly more than 20 would be primary aldosteronism. And I know classically, People are like, oh, we have to test them off meds. So this guy's on four meds. Y- you you mentioned you can sort of still interpret the the readings on meds. So people that that's still out there. I think that people just like you can't test on meds at all. That's only in a research study. It's such a bad um, recommendation because it's just such a way to lose patients. Like you're not gonna you you can't stop all these medications safely. Also, their blood pressure goes sky high. I have so much trouble with it, even in the patients where we're doing it because we absolutely have to because for confirmation. Um, it's really problematic, and you shouldn't. And nobody in our hypertension specialty practice does that now. We all leave them on all of their medications unless they are on a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, in which case that you have to stop for a month before testing. Everything else, you can keep them on. Yeah. Um, if they're on a really high dose of amiloride, you need to stop it also because that can also interfere. But at anything else, you can keep it on. Um, and, and so in this guy, so as you mentioned, the aldosterone is 12. So he's not quite above that threshold. The old threshold used to be you had to have an aldosterone above 20. Now we're getting a little more conservative about it. And we think, no, actually an aldosterone above 15 is probably primary aldo, especially if you have a uh, suppressed renin. And part of that is because the assays are problematic. Um, if I see somebody's got borderline results and I have a high level of suspicion like this guy, I recheck in a few months um, because we know that the labs aren't that, that useful, aren't that consistent. And on the recheck, if I see that it really, it, that the renin is suppressed and that that aldo is crept up a little bit, I, I have a higher level of suspicion for primary aldo. Um, but either way, in this guy, it, let's say his aldo was, was four even or was five, he still has that suppressed renin. And so that really tells you a lot about him that he truly is volume overloaded and that he really is probably sensitive to salt and that he really needs specific targeted treatment for that suppressed renin, which is similar to how you treat primary aldo anyway. Um, You can either treat that patient with a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist like spironolactone or plerinone, or you can treat him with amiloride, which we find is a really effective specific treatment specifically in these patients with just suppressed renin. 
Um, and, and so they, they tend to respond incredibly well to it. We get a lot of people like him, but who also come in with symptomatic paroxysmal hypertension, um, but this, the same story otherwise. Um, and besides the hydralazine being the cause, it's also often um, because they have some salty meals and some non-salty meals. Uh, and, and that drives the symptomatic uh, paroxysms of high blood pressure. Um, and they'll tell you that they've tried cutting sodium before and it didn't work. But I think most people don't know what it really means to cut sodium in the American diet. Paul, I saw you do like a double take when she said Milleride. No, it's, well, it's, 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 I bumped up against this a couple of times and I'm just excited to have an answer. Um, because I, where I've had, had a couple of patients with a suppressed run in, but the Aldo is really not terribly impressive. And you're like, well, shucks now, now what do I do with this specifically? And like, it's, you know, how aggressive for the workup and that kind of stuff. And it just, I got very excited from yeah. a subset of my own patients. Actually, so, It's a Littles like syndrome is what it's considered. Uh, Littles is one of these uh, unusual channelopathies that only nephrologists ever have to get tested about on the boards. And, uh, and that's treated with milleride and it's a very similar state. It's this like very mild Aldo excess state where you don't see an elevated Aldo, but they behave like primary Aldo. Okay, so it sounds like in this person, we might be able to uh, start him. Can you tell us what's a starting dose of a milleride? And would you go to a milleride first? If this, let's say you tell him the side effects of potential side effects of a plerinone or spironolactone, he's like, I, he's very worried about sex drive. He's worried about the gynecomastia. Are, are those at the doses that you might have to use for him? Are those something that you see a lot? They so in spironolactone, yes, um, and we do see a lot of gynecomastia. Not a lot, but we see more than what you would want. Any mm. gynecomastia is horrible, um, <laughs> True. and so so um, I do still use spironolactone in men quite a bit because it's so potent and it's just a very effective medication, even just for resistant hypertension. It really should be our fourth agent for just about everybody. But it's important to have that conversation exactly. And if he's somebody who's like, if I get erectile dysfunction, I've never taken this medication. I don't care. Then I say, okay, you know what? It's not going to be a good fit and or try it. And then when it's not a good fit, the next step will be a milleride. Um, but in a lot of men, we just start with a milleride if their aldosterone is not very elevated. Um, and it's really very effective uh, for treating this. Um, it's, it really can melt uh, the problem. Um, I usually start them initially either at two and a half milligrams daily, which is a half a pill or five milligrams daily. Um, it can cause some stomach upset the first few days, um, which tends to go away on its own. That's really the most common side effect I hear. And some patients get some lightheadedness on it the first few days. I think it's because they're not used to having their blood pressure controlled, honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so that's why I tend to start a little bit lower because if they're really, really um, responsive to it, they can be incredibly responsive to a low dose. And then if they're not, I give them the expectation of if in the first few days you're feeling fine, um, just increase the dose. Uh, just start with a half pill the first few days. Uh, that that's only again, because when I really have a high suspicion that this is a volume overloaded, like guy like this, who has, has yeah. a, a renin of less than 0.1, <laughs> that it might melt it. Sometimes it doesn't. And I've had to have patients go up to much higher doses. So, um, it, they only come in five milligram tablets, unfortunately, cause it's not that commonly used of a medication. Um, so I'll go to the five and then I'll, I'll increase it to five twice a day, um, pretty quickly within, within two to three weeks. If it's not, if they're not adequately controlled. Um, usually I don't have to go much higher than that. Um, or if you're not seeing enough effect with that, that's when I would then add a plerinone on, um, I bypass spironolactone in this guy. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and the starting dose of, uh, spironolactone or a plerinone, is it just sort of like the, the lowest dose? And then you might go to t twice the lowest dose to, to start. It depends on the situation, honestly. Um, so with an elevated creatinine, but a low potassium, I'd be okay starting with 25 milligrams of spironolactone in someone like him. If you're worried about adverse effects, if you're worried about um, uh, uh, the, an like a more elevated creatinine than that or, or, or higher potassium levels, um, then start with 12 and a half of spironolactone because it can be quite potent. Um, a plerinone, I would start with 25 milligrams. It's less potent. Um, and the, and always make sure you're checking a potassium and a sodium within a couple of weeks of starting it. And what do you, in, in your experience, a patient like Peter, who's on four agents, do you, could, could we get him off the hydralazine? He's like, I don't want to take a medicine three times a day. Can you get him off that once you get oh, him yeah. on the appropriate agents? What, how much I of usually, this do you, <laughs> could he come off of? <laughs> You're so excited about usually this theoretical like patient the coming off the hydralazine. <laughs> usually the second I start the, um, the milleride at the two and a half, that's also part of it. Like if their blood pressure starts lowering, I'm just like, then stop. Like 
go down to 25 TID of the hydralazine, go up to five of amiloride, then stop the hydralazine. I usually will alternate them. I won't do them too quickly because you want to know if someone's having adverse events or something else that you know the cause. So I usually make these changes every two weeks. I do it all over messaging with patients. I don't make them come back for visits if I know that they're checking their blood pressures at home. Um, and a lot of the time, what I'll do is I'll write it all out for my nurse ahead of time, telling her if this, then that, so that I don't even have to be involved. And the nurse just relays the, the, relays the patient based on what he sends in. Okay. So Jordy, let's, let's talk about Peter's concern about his lower urinary tract symptoms with the hydrochlorothiazide. I feel like oftentimes with the thiazide specifically, I, that's a concern that patients bring up. They don't want a water pill because they don't want to have to pee more frequently. And, and so I guess when, when that does come up for you, how do you address that with patients and how do you talk to them about that concern? Yeah, it's a really important point. And it's also really common, I think, with women who are, as they're older with incontinence being a very common problem too. Uh, and we have a lot of patients that'll just absolutely refuse to ever be on a diuretic for that reason, which is problematic because it can really impact our ability to adequately con control their hypertension, especially in someone like him who's clearly salt sensitive, who, or uh, some people don't like that phrase. That's why I keep hedging on it. Um, who clearly, <laughs> who clearly is volume overloaded. Um, and part of why he urinates so much and why he had the nocturia is probably because he was eating too much sodium. Um, it actually can cause increased no um, nocturesis. It can make people end up waking up several times overnight to urinate if they have a really high sodium diet during the day. Um, and yeah, hydrochlor hydrochlorothiazide can exacerbate that. And particularly because hydrochlorothiazide only has that sort of 12 hour duration that it lasts. So you take it in the morning, you have that American salty dinner. And then you go to bed and then you're going to be peeing all night because you were more sodium avid after your hydrochlorothiazide wore off and you had the salty dinner. Um, and so I pretty much will just tell patients that I'll spell it out for them. I'm like, it's because you're like the medication just brought out the fact that you're eating too much salt. I don't eat salt, though. I don't add salt to my meals. I don't use a salt shaker at home. OK, how many times a week, though, do you eat at a restaurant? <laughs> um, how many times a week do you get takeout? How much soup do you eat? That's from a can. Um, and I really have those conversations with patients to try to dig out what they're eating because I think that can be a huge, huge role. Um, the other thing that can help is chlorthalidone. We're touting it so much, uh, but because it's longer acting, you don't see quite as much of that increased sodium avidity later in the day. It doesn't necessarily fix the problem, but it helps. Um, I also let them know, though, that the amylaride, because it's targeting this exact issue, um, they tend to see less nocturia. And I really haven't had any complaints of nocturia from these patients that couldn't tolerate hydrochlorothiazide from, from when they use amylaride or a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. I think because, again, it's just so much more targeted at the source. This has all been extraordinarily helpful and will change the way that I manage blood pressure, which is like, annoying because I have a lot of patients with high <laughs> blood pressure, but I, I'm glad to have the information at my disposal now. Um, so I, I guess before we, we let you escape, because we've, we've held you hostage for well over an hour at this point, I, are there any, what are your major take-home points that you hope our listeners will walk away from this episode with? Major take home points are that the way we measure blood pressure in the clinic is atrocious and we really need to be enabling our patients to get better quality blood pressures. I think the best way we can do that is using validated home blood pressure devices where they can check their blood pressure correctly at home if we give them the tools to do that. I've been so surprised and impressed with the patients that I didn't think would be able to do it that have just done such a great job at doing that. Um, and so we need to, again, check our biases at the door and just make sure that we give our that we empower our patients to do a great job of measuring their blood pressure so that we can then manage it well. Um, we need to trust what they do, but we need to give them the tools to do that. Uh, so that's the biggest take, -ho take home point. And then I think just the fact that we underuse diuretics, of course, we have to, with great power comes great responsibility. These are amazing medications. We have to watch carefully when we use them. So I probably might get a little overzealous about them, but I can't stress enough how important it is to monitor labs as you're titrating these to go low and slow. Um, but to know that in patients with kidney disease, you probably have to go much higher than the doses that you're comfortable with. So always feel free to involve a nephrologist. We're happy to help. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> Best one yet. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, please sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest. Get it? Digest. Recapping the latest practice changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high value, practice changing knowledge. So we want your feedback. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or now on Spotify, or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our producer for this episode, Malini Gandhi. Also, a special thanks to our whole team. Beth Garbs Garbatelli is our executive producer and runs Twitter. Maddie Mad Dog Morgan is on Instagram. Tima Karganov is on the website. 
Our theme music is written by Stuart Brigham. Claire Morgan of Notterly edits the show. And Chris the Chew Man Chew is on Facebook. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME for all healthcare professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And Paul, with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and good night. This message is brought to you by Regeneron. If you have diabetes, listen closely because your ears could help your eyes. Excess sugar from diabetes could lead to eye damage and vision loss or even blindness, and you might not even notice it at first. So remember, now is the time to get your eyes checked. Eye care is especially important with diabetes. See a path forward with actions and potential treatment options that may help your eyes and protect against vision loss. Go see an eye care specialist and visit nowic.com to take charge of your sight. Join Tubi in celebrating Black History Month with the largest free collection of black cinema streaming every day of the year, including exclusive Tubi originals, Howard High and Pass the Mic. Tubi, watch free.